Anyways, they ignored the cones. But they remind us, under construction. Now, think about that a little bit. And it's a good time to think about this with construction that we've been displaced. We've been over in the youth building. We, you know, had to do different things, go different ways, come in other doors, all these things. Because we've been constructing and working and remodeling and all these things. That's part of it. If you've ever done it in your house, you've gone through that. Any place you've worked, uh, if they paved the highway, you know, all that is part of renewal and updating and changing and all those kinds of things. And what I wanted to show you this morning in Scripture is the church is under construction. So stand up and let's read one verse here in Matthew 16, 18. And then some of the things, the passage I read before and all that's going to relate to it. But look at this in Matthew where in verse 18 uh, it says, and this is Jesus speaking, it says, um, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. Let me read it to you again. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. May God bless the reading and the understanding and the doing of his word. You may be seated. So let's think about this passage and apply it to what we're talking about this morning, a church under construction. Jesus said he would build his church. Amen? Okay, I just read that, so everybody in here should have that concept. And so one of the things I wanted to tell you this morning is we need to quit striving for what he has already given us. Can I just tell you to take a deep breath this morning? <sighs> it's not your responsibility to build his church. It's not my responsibility to build his church. Jesus said he would build his church. Amen? Now, he's going to use us, his people, his followers. But the fretting and the worrying and the, oh, my gosh, and what about this? And, oh, no, what if that doesn't work right? Or all these things. And I'm going to tell you, I've been in churches that have had all kinds of issues and problems over all kinds of things including what color the carpet was going to be or do we build a new building or not build a new building or you know what are we going to do all these things and i think what we've got to remember is the church doesn't belong to us he said i will build his church and so the minute you start trying to hold on to it like it's yours like it's your responsibility that's going to be a problem I'm just going to tell you right now. The first thing we've got to realize is the church is a work in progress. Jesus said in this passage, I will build my church. He didn't say, I built my church. He said, I will build my church. And so with that, you need to understand what he's saying there is, I'm going to keep on building my church. And let me just say something to you right now. We just kind of sang about this just a few uh, minutes ago. Um, you know, when you hear the trumpet sound. The writer of that hymn says, Then may in him I be found. Okay? You see, when the trumpet sounds, then... The church is finished. Amen? It won't be finished until he comes back. People will say all the time, Brother Stephen, oh, it could be any day now. And it could. Oh, Brother Stephen, the way everything's going in this world, it, it can't be very long. Well, that's true. But I'm just telling you, Jesus is not going to come back. He's not going to return until the church that he is building is finished. What's he waiting on? Why is it taking so long? 
Well, I'll tell you what he's waiting on. He's waiting on everyone that he already knows that's coming to him comes. That's what he's waiting on. He's not waiting on Trump to be president. Okay? Just so we get that. He's not waiting on politics or the government or my issues or the church in, of the United States of America rising up or, or change. He's not waiting on that, folks. He's waiting on the last sheep that hears his voice and responds to come. That's what Jesus is waiting on. And so when he says, I'm going to build my church and he's going to use us to do it, what does that mean for us? It means we're supposed to be about what he has called us to do. We're a work in progress and we're only complete when Jesus says so and then he's going to return. So what do we, what, what do we say then? I say, let's go. Let's do it. Let's get involved. Not in necessarily all the other stuff. That could be part of it. But what is most important? What is Jesus saying? When he says, I will build my church. Look in that verse in verse 18. He says, um, I say to you that you are Peter. And upon this rock. He's not saying Peter is the rock. He's saying upon this rock. And then if you go up to verse 17. It says, and Jesus answered and said to him. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. That's Simon, son of Jonah. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. What is this? It's his testimony. When, when Peter says in verse 16, And Simon Peter answered him and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. The son of the living God. That is the rock. That is the foundation of the church. Without that, there is no church. Well, what about other ways or other people? What if you're just really a good person? What if you've walked down the aisle? What if you got baptized? What if you're another world religion? Buddha or Muhammad? No. That's not the foundation. What is the foundation? What does Jesus say? He says, after Simon answers him and says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You can't actually believe and give testimony that Jesus is the Son of God that takes away the sins of the world unless it is revealed to you by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to reveal that to you. So that's the firm foundation that everything we do as a church is based upon. So I say, let's go. That's what Jimmy did this morning. He gave testimony, not that he was saved because he was baptized, but he was saved because he believed in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And he identifies with what Jesus did on the cross, not by going to the cross himself, but through immersion in baptism. So we're supposed to follow the master's plan. We're supposed to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author, perfecter, and finisher of our faith. We're supposed to grow and mature in our life. We're a work in progress. No believer, no Christ follower ever says, well, that's enough for me. I'm done. I'll just sit here in my easy chair until Jesus comes back. No. Because we still have to grow. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 in your Bibles. And let's see what Paul wrote about this idea because we're talking about believers and Christians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 1 through 3 Hang on Let me go to 2 Corinthians Chapter 3. 
1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. Paul writes, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to babes. Every day, hopefully, we're trying to be more like our Savior and learn and to respond and react to the world like He would. That's what God wants us to do. The second thing is a church under construction, like Eastside, is well attended. You say, well, it should be. Yeah, it should. I praise the Lord this morning. Our Sunday school director told me that we had 76 in Sunday school. I shout hallelujah for that. It's been since COVID since we had that many in Sunday school. Our Sunday school attendance is going up week by week. And I'll just tell you, I love everyone that's sitting here in worship today. But if you want to grow and you want to mature in your faith and you want to have uh, dialogue about what the word says and what it means, you need to be in a Bible study class. Can I just encourage you, if you haven't been coming to Sunday school, to get back in a Bible study class where you're looking at the Word of God, where you're talking about what it, how it's telling us to live and what's important for our lives as followers of Christ. Everyone in the church plays a part. We all have a part to play. Remember last week, and I had talked to Herman, and he mentioned it in a sermon. Jesus is the head of the body, and the body is the church. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. That's true. I'm not going to deny that. But if you want to grow and mature in your faith and become everything that Christ wants you to be as a follower of Christ, you're best going to be able to do that. Being involved in a New Testament church that is lifting Christ up, that is built on the foundation. That Jesus is Savior and Lord. So when it says well attended, that's what we're talking about. And if you think back to what I read earlier in a Bible passage from Matthew chapter 13. And we looked at the passage in verse 25 through 30. The parable of the wheat and the tares. We're talking about the church. Jesus is speaking of the church. And he's saying that there's wheat and tares. There's going to be, when you see a wheat field, there's a lot of it. The church is going to be well attended by lots of people. But it is interesting to note that there's also going to be tares in the church. That's why we're told in Scripture to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, just because you attend a church doesn't mean you belong to Jesus. Just because you walked down an aisle or just because you were baptized or maybe just because you were a deacon or maybe just because you're the preacher. That doesn't mean you're wheat. No. Wheat are those who have believed and put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you put your faith and trust in your parents because they were churchgoers, or because the preacher said to get baptized, or because if I do a lot of these things, or give a lot of money, or any of those things, nothing, nothing. The only thing that you have to do is believe. That's it. That's what we're told. We have to remember to place all the things that God has given us as his believers into his use. Our talents, our gifts, our abilities. In everything that is in the church. What is the church supposed to be doing then? It's on that foundation. Worship's part of it. Worship coming together to praise and give adoration to our Father. And lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior. Fellowship, like we had last week. And fellowship can become, come in many different forms. But that is one of the things we're told to do as a church. Hebrews 10.25, forsake not the fellowship of the believers. That's a good thing. Evangelism is part of what we are to do as the church. 
Because Jesus commanded us to go. And he said, go to your hometown and further out and further out even unto the uttermost ends of the earth. Of course, studying the word of God, growing, maturing, coming to a better understanding of what, how God wants us to live. And then certainly prayer. Scripture says in the Old Testament that this is supposed to be a house of prayer. And that's what Jesus said. That's what made him so upset when he came to the temple and they were trading and all the money changers were out there. And when Jesus saw it, he became upset. He said, my father's house is to be a house of And so what does that mean for us? We all have a part to play. We're a team, if you will. Together, everyone achieves more. You've probably heard that before. Maybe you've seen it on a a baseball dugout or a basketball arena. But it's just as true for the church. Together, everyone achieves more. One of the things I hope to do in the next couple of weeks, maybe next week if I can get it all together, is have a place where you can sign up to be involved in areas of our church that it takes all of us to do. Ministry areas. For example, you may, maybe, you've got the, maybe you love kids and you want to work with kids. You say, well, Brother Stephen, we've got a committee that does that. I'm just telling you, one of the things I've learned in almost 20 years of pastoring and in youth ministry, it takes more than just five people on a committee. Well, what if that committee had a list of names of people who said, hey, when you're doing something, when you're working on a project, when something's going on, call us. Use us. Let us help you. We want to be involved in this area we are gifted in this area. Well, you can't, you can't serve. You rotate it off the committee. No. Who's, no. If you are gifted in town, volunteer, ask to help. Well, let's get a list of some of these names and some phone numbers. And, hey, I'll do it. I'll wash dishes. I'll uh, cook meals. I'll take the trash out. I'll, I can't do much, but I'll do what I can. I'll pray. I like people. I like talking. I'll go out to the powwow and visit with people and pray with people. Whatever the spiritual gift is, let's start using them. Because the church is more than just coming and sitting in the pew. As a matter of fact, I declare to you, that's not the church. That's sitting in the pew. The church is a work in progress. It's well attended because we come together to worship together. To fellowship together, we need the encouragement, but we're also supposed to be about evangelism and growing in our faith and maturing and praying for people and reaching out to a lost and dying world. That's the church. A church under construction is also willing to pay the cost. We've been given everything we need to carry out the mission that Christ gave the church. Everything. And Jesus said that he would build the church. So we need to quit striving for what he's already given us. The Holy Spirit. God will lead us. His Spirit will guide us. And he knows those who are his. You say, well, Brother Stephen, there's wheat and tares. I'm just telling you, don't worry about that. Pray, though. Pray for people to come to the realization, to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, to an understanding that the only way they're going into eternity isn't by doing things, isn't by being a member of a church, isn't by watching a preacher on TV or even singing a hymn, It's by knowing Jesus and believing in what he said about himself. That he is the son of God that came to take away the sins of the world. 2 Timothy 2.19 says that the Lord knows those who are his. I don't have to worry about it. God already knows those who are his. John 1.12 
John writes, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Brother Stephen, but, but if they believe, surely they're supposed to believe and walk down an aisle. Or surely they're supposed to believe and get baptized. Or, or have, be a part of a Bible study. Boy, some of y'all, I mean, you got it made. Because you, you did this Bible study and that Bible study, another Bible study, another Bible study, another Bible study, another Bible study. Sometimes, you know, we've studied the book of Hosea eight times. How many times did it take to get it? Oh, yeah, God can still reveal. What I'm saying is God wants us to do it, not just read about it. Get involved. Be part of the team. Get into the game. That's what we're talking about. A church under construction is a work in progress. Don't fret over it all. God's got this, and it'll be done when he says it's done. Oh, and I've said this before. You know that. And don't worry about it. You'll know it when Jesus is coming back, okay? All this stuff about, oh, well, we know it. I don't want to miss it. You will know it. You will know it. It's well attended. Yes, we should be part of the local church. Be involved in a church. A church that is built on the foundation, not of an awesome building. And it's awesome to come into a house of the Lord and be comfortable and it be in a place of beauty because that's our God. That's what He deserves. He deserves our best. Amen? Well, that was weak. He deserves our best. <laughs> he deserves our best. Yeah, I know. I'm ashamed too. Church under construction is willing to pay the cost. You say, what do you mean by that, preacher? It's different for everyone. The cost of discipleship Following Christ will cost you something. In this world, you can't follow Christ and expect that it'll just all be roses. He didn't only get roses. He went to the cross. All of, almost all of the early church fathers all were martyred for their faith. Most of the New Testament church underwent persecution in one form or fashion. So do we expect that we're going to just follow Christ and it's going to be hunky-dory, no problems, no issues, no persecution? Show me where that is in Scripture. I don't know where some of these guys are getting at. But I do know this. We've got to be willing to pay the cost. That's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote about, the German theologian who decided to stay in Germany despite friends and other theologians from other parts of the world saying, we'll pay for you to get out, we'll sneak you out, we'll do anything we can to get you out of Germany. And he said, no, I'm going to stay here so I can be a witness and a testimony the best I can to my people. He ended up being martyred and put to death just shortly before the end of the war. And I just think he knew something of when Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. And it's different for everyone. We can't judge each other. Don't look at somebody else and say, well, they're doing that. Why can't I do that? Or how come I'm not over there? Boy, look at that. People have different gifts, talents, and abilities. You don't believe me? Look at John chapter 21. It's laid out very plainly to us all. As Jesus has been resurrected and he's meeting with his disciples... In John 21, verse 17 through 22, when he has an encounter with them there on the seashore and he actually has breakfast with them. And in verse 17, he said to them a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. Remember what I read earlier? The Lord knows those who belong to him. He knows all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, then tend my sheep. 
Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish, but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now, does that sound like Jesus is saying, boy, if you come follow me, you're going to get a new car every year and you're going to have a big fancy house. You might even have a second home at you know, some resort location and you're going to be able to get you a jet to fly around in the country. You're just going to be blessed all over the place. How do you get that out of that passage? Are we special above everybody else? I don't think so. Now, this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to them, follow me. Peter, turning around, said to the disciple whom Jesus loved, following them, the one who also had leaned back on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, therefore, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Oh, here we go. Well, what about him? What about what he's doing? Lord, you need to get on to his case. You need to tell him something. Di- you know, quit looking at everybody else and keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen? He is the author, perfecter, and finisher of our faith. It's not the pastor. It's not the deacons. It's not the, the spiritual uh, leader of different groups or ministries in the church. It's not the pope. It's not Billy Graham. It's Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. Not follow the pastor or follow a mentor or spirit. Follow me. Jesus said to him in verse 22, If I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Are you willing to pay the cost? Whatever... It is, it's worth it, I can tell you that. And it'll be different for, for everybody. Don't look at somebody else and go, well, they, it doesn't seem like they're having to pay much. You let them worry about that between them and the Lord. Go back to last week. Except the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain that build it. Jesus, the great master builder, said, I will build my church. So east side is a church under construction and we're all part of the construction crew different ones do different things some things and one of the things we've learned through all this you can there's some things you can't do till the other guys get their stuff done and we have to wait on them to get their stuff done then we can step it's all part of a team together everyone achieves more whether it's a ball team that plays together in unity and they'll probably be successful, or whether it's a construction team or a church. We all have to be on the same page. Aaron Wren astutely observed in First Things that evangelical Christians up until 1994 were mostly viewed in a positive light. But after 1994... Moral norms seemed that the basic level of society began to change. And from 1994 to 2014, he says, society began to take a neutral stance on Christianity. Christianity became a valid option with a pluralistic public square. In other words, you could be Christian, that was okay, but that's not really what everything has to be. And now... After 2014, we begin to enter into a time where Christianity is viewed in a more negative light. Morality is expressly repudiated and seen as a threat to the public good and the new public moral order. Times have changed. Things are different. Now, I'll say this. I thank God I live in Comanche because we're some years behind a lot of that. But... It's changing all around us, and it's going to happen here as well. As a result of these changes, subscribing to Christian moral views 
or violating the secular moral order brings negative consequences. What is the secular moral order? Do whatever thou wilt is the whole of the law. And I'm telling you, it comes right out of the satanic Bible. If it feels good, do it. Don't feel guilty about anything. You should be able to do whatever it is you want to do. How do we respond in a world like this? As a church under construction, as followers of Christ who are trying to be more Christ-like, how do we respond when the world hates us? By the way, Jesus said in John chapter 15, don't be surprised if the world hates you. Remember, it hated me first. How do you respond? Jesus taught us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That's our response. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. That's the exact same response Jesus had when they put him on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So folks, today, whether you're here in person or viewing online, whether you're a member of Eastside or another church or maybe you're one of the tares, we've got a choice. We can be the change that we want to see or we can ask Jesus to change us and be changed in the people that he wants to use to bring change into the world. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus tells the church at Laodicea, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. He's speaking to the church. If anyone will open the door. That means there's actually some that Jesus is knocking and they won't open the door. That's the implication of what he's saying there. But for those that will open the door, you see, Jesus is standing there waiting to be invited in to a life of deeper personal intimacy and in a relationship with him that you may not have even been able to imagine. But will you open the door? The good news is he's waiting at the door. He's waiting for you to open the door today. What are you going to do? Are you going to open the door? We're a church under construction. As people of Eastside, we're a work in progress. We're well attended and we're growing in our attendance back to hopefully pre-COVID numbers. But I say even beyond that. Because there's a whole world of people out there that don't know him. And our job is to tell them and to show them how much God loves them. That he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. Are we willing to pay the cost to do that? Let's pray together. Almighty God and Father in heaven. May you do with me as you will. Help us to put our lives in your hands and to trust you fully and completely with it. Knowing that you're the great master builder. That you've laid out the plan and we trust you in it. And know that we won't be finished. The church won't be finished. East side won't be finished until Jesus returns. Until that time, may we see about your business. Father God, speak to our hearts. If there's anyone here that has never put their faith and trust in Jesus as Lord really just crying out to you saying I believe in Jesus I'm following him with my life it's as simple as it is no wordy prayers no magic formulas just 
saying, I want to follow Jesus. And I trust him with my life and my eternity. May today be the day of salvation. Father God, but for those of us that are believers and followers, may we look at our lives and realize that every day you stand at the door and knock and want to come in supposed to be. Take this time and use it for your honor and glory. And we pray it in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Let's all stand and have a time of invitation. The altar will be open here if you would like to come and pray about issues or things that you're facing or dealing with. I'll be here to pray with you. Any decision that you would like to make, if you want to accept Christ as Savior your Lord and you want to make that public, what better place to do it than in His church? Maybe you want to follow Christ in believer's baptism. We can take care of that as the first step of obedience and being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you would like to come and just say, I want to rededicate my life to living for Jesus and following Him. Whatever decisions God's put on your heart, if you would like to make those public today, and the Holy Spirit is leading you to do that, you come as we sing. you but I know for me I know I can do better not that God's going to be pleased with what I do I can't make God love me any more than he already does but I I want to serve him better I want to hear him say well done thou good and faithful servant No one looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you would just join me in that, say, Preacher, I just want to serve my Savior, and I want to be found faithful to Him. He was faithful to me. Would you just lift your hand up? Oh, lots of hands going up, yes. In the center, on the right, more than I can count. Anyone else? I want to be found faithful. Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. Anyone else? Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for these that have indicated that they want to serve you with a whole heart. Physically, mentally, socially. With our gifts, our talents, our time. Lord God, 
even our resources that you have given us and blessed us with. We want to lay it all on the altar for you, Father. Because in the end, the only thing that's going to matter is, did we know you? And if we knew you, did we serve you and love you? Father, I lift up all those that have indicated with uplifted hands. And there may have been some that just had an uplifted heart. That just said, Father, take my heart. Use it. Reveal to me what I should do for you. No condemnation. No judgment. God, help us to love each other. Encourage each other. Support each other. In our ministry. In the task that we have been given. be salt and light in a lost and dying world. May we have the joy of our salvation and the relationship with you to share with the world. Help us every day, Father. May we look to you and follow you. We're going to sing one more stanza and then we'll be dismissed. Let's sing it like we mean it. Before you leave, I've got Jimmy and Heather here at the front. Um, I'd get their whole family up here, but man, I think, I don't know if they'd fit, but they're certainly welcome to come. They just, just come shake their hand, hug their neck, say you love them. Jimmy's been a faithful servant of our church for a pretty good while now. He does a tremendous job uh, keeping our church clean and presentable, um, and he, he does it as he's working unto the Lord, I can tell you, and that's how we're supposed to do it. Uh, so I say amen. Praise the Lord for that. All right. Uh, you come and Wes, close us out.